All right, on this week's video, we have the privilege of speaking with Randy Cummings from Bootstrap Farmer. I've got a lot of cool questions lined up for him about high tunnel varieties and about hoop house growing. Check it out. Randy, how's it going today? Hey, doing all right, Tracy. Doing good, man. All right, let's get right into this because that's what the viewers want to know. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background history, kind of where you came from and yeah. uh, what, what you've been doing the last couple of years? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I've been with Bootstrap for about three months now. Uh, Tracy, love it. Uh, definitely feels like uh, like home. But for 10 years uh, before that, I worked for a nationally known uh, seed company working with commercial scale growers. So first couple of years, I worked with Canadian growers and helping them kind of grow in their shorter season and try to help them find ways to kind of extend their season in the winter months. Um, and then a few years after that, um, got assigned a new sales territory for that seed company, uh, working with growers mainly in the Southwest and Central U.S. Funny enough, helping them extend their season into the summer where it can be too hot to grow in um, some crops and sometimes the year. So kind of getting both ends of that spectrum. And then the last few years um, had been kind of managing our sales team as well as uh, supporting a lot of uh, larger microgreen and hydroponic uh, kind of factory scale farming, um, you know, one, two, 10 acre greenhouses with all the bells and whistles and, um, and all that. So definitely, you know, recurring themes of protective culture, you know, from low hoops to caterpillar tunnels to low tech greenhouses, all the way up to, you know, everything baked into this super efficient, you know, hydroponic growing method and style. So that's pretty um, awesome. Um, yeah, um, that's pretty neat stuff. And it sounds like we could probably have five or six episodes just talking about <laughs> just talking about what you've seen and what you've, you know, what, what you've run across in the last 10 or 15 years or so. But uh, on today's episode, though, we do have uh, three or four questions that I came up with um, that I wanted to ask you about. And uh, I'm sure that or other people that are um, interested in those kind of uh, issues also. So we're just going to go right into it. Um, growing undercover, growing outside. I think I think what's great about it, Tracy, is you, you can control some of those variables, right? So you can control how much water the crop gets, right? You got a roof over the top, protect it from the rain, and then you can give it exactly what it needs. You know, you can amend the soil in that one spot. You can exclude insects through some, you know, insect netting and, and things like that. But um, I think for, for growers either thinking about going down that, that path um, or ones I already have, um, I think it's important to realize that structure is gonna be 10, maybe even 15 degrees warmer inside. And it might have some humidity in there too with air trapped in there uh, versus outside. So for some times of the month or, or year rather, that's a boom, right? If you can get 10 degrees warmer in that structure in November, December, January, February, perfect. You know, keep that crop from, from freezing solid or um, going through those crazy temperature uh, changes throughout a winter day. Um, you know, you're off to the races. But in the summer, um, there's also some challenges there battling the heat, you know, um, where it could be 10 or 15 degrees warmer inside. So, um, a high tunnel and a greenhouse, uh, you know, these are perfect tools to, to help growers extend their season, um, battle the elements, but you kind of need to know some of these things going in just to set yourself up for success and avoid some of the pitfalls where, um, you know, these structures, there's a little bit of a learning curve to them. And, yeah. uh, you know, so as long as you're thinking about the fact that it's going to be 10 degrees warmer in there in the summertime and we should proactively probably have shade and buy shade at the same time you're buying your structure and not have to wait until your crop's already dead <laughs> to have it get shipped <laughs> to you, right? Or, yeah. or you know, um, you know, roll up sides where you can get some airflow in there and, and get some of that hot, humid air pulled out of the structure, um, you know, so you don't get things like blossom end drop on your uh, on your tomatoes where they just can't handle the heat or your lettuce wants to bolt or whatever it is. Um, you know, those are the things you you really need to kind of think about just a little bit in advance. Airflow. Airflow is a big Absolutely. one that, you know, that's, I thought I had a good handle on, you know, I, 
I have, I'm lucky enough to have two uh, high tunnels here. I have an all metal kit and then I also have a DIY one that I built first going through. And, you know, I, I thought I knew everything on that one. You know, I was growing lettuces and bok choys all through, all winter long and stuff. And I thought I was, you know, high on the mountain. And then um, this other kit that I have is in a different area of my farm. You know, it, it might as well be on the other side of the country compared to where my, my first one is. And uh, I've struggled a lot, uh, which, you know, you know, we've had conversations on the phone about it. And um, uh, so, yeah, there is a big learning curve when it comes to this. I wish I would have thought of half of the things we've talked about in the last three months um, before I actually put that kit there. Maybe I would have done some stuff a little different. Maybe I would have made the sides a little taller. Maybe I would have put some different vents in. Maybe I would have uh, had bigger fans. Maybe, I, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, you know, or like our next topic we're going to talk about, uh, high tunnel varieties. Maybe I would have more of a high tunnel variety instead of a generic brand that I thought, oh, well, this is going to work. You know, there's thousands of people on YouTube growing this variety in their high tunnels. They don't have any issues, you know. So going forward with that, um, you do come from a reputable seed company, so I'm just going to ask you, high tunnel varieties, um, when it comes to vegetables or flowers, are they really worth the extra money compared to the off of the shelf uh, generic, I want to say, sure. big box store or even a reputable seed company, um, just plain Jane seed? You know, are yeah. they really worth the hype? And, and I don't have any skin in the game at this point, Tracy, right? There's, there's nothing right. for me to gain by steering you down one path versus the other. But what, what I'll say is, I, I'm a, I always like to kind of underscore that a variety can't be good at everything. It can't taste good. It can't be bolt resistant and heat resistant and yields great and produce seed great and um, have all the disease resistance and, and all these characteristics, beautiful color. Uh, it just can't do everything. Um, you know, that's why it is, it's no different than just genetics with everything. You either have blue eyes or brown eyes, blonde hair or brown hair, but you can't have blonde hair and brown hair at the same time, right? <laughs> so, or theoretically, right? So the variety, seed varieties are the same way. Um, so when you're looking at high tunnel varieties or greenhouse varieties, these are varieties that um, have been bred and observed over time where they, um, you know, put on really good, uh, you know, root structure of a plant and um, give themselves a good backbone, you know, these intermediate um, uh, indeterminate uh, tomatoes, right? They put on good vines, good leaf, they support themselves for a really long growing season. And then they, and then the yield is there. Um, the disease resistance for a high tunnels there. They're, they're resistant to leaf mold and blossom end rot and, um, mildews and things like that. Um, so they've set themselves up for success for a lot of the common challenges of growing in a high tunnel. Right. So, but what they can't necessarily do is hang with the varieties that are planted out in the field that go through uh, really cold nights. You know, that high tunnel variety isn't going to perform as strong in the field, but in the high tunnel, it's going to out yield and out produce um, and thrive in that environment where an heirloom or open pollinated or field variety just just more. So right. um, that's what you're that's what you're looking at with those genetics. You're looking at varieties that have the disease resistance that of diseases that are commonly found in high tunnels. They're they're you know they may do better on tighter spacing. They may do better, um, you know, when the temperature is more, more even in there and doesn't fluctuate. So um, for those reasons, I'm a huge fan of planting varieties that are suited for the high tunnel, have been called out and labeled for the high tunnel and greenhouse. And to me, it's like an insurance policy. You're paying maybe a little bit more for the seed, um, but you're drastically increasing your yield and your uh, your success rate. And 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 I agree with you on that. This year, you know, with with talking to you and uh, the seed company that I use, uh, you 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 know, you've kind of turned me on to someone that I've been talking to about varieties. And 
And uh, she has explained stuff to me also. And I, I, I knew it was important, but I didn't think it was that important. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on that. Um, going with that also, since we are kind of in that high tunnel uh, talk right now, what about the other things? Um, shade cloth, insect netting, uh, sure. drip, overhead watering, uh, anything like that. What, what do you have to, um, or kind of yeah. like, what do, you, what, do you, what do you have on those kind of issues? Sure, <laughs> sure. And, and I want to just pause just for a second, Tracy, and, and talk, you know, just the concept I like to impart, um, going back to the, the varieties and, um, you know, stuff that's suited for the greenhouse. Um, a concept I like to talk about is everything in that high tunnel has, anything you grow on the farm has to pay rent. If it's going to be on your farm and it's going to take time and energy and resources from you, it needs to pay rent. Yes. And, and that high tunnel or greenhouse, it's an, ex, it's an expensive piece of equipment. And you might have lights in there. You may have heat, you may have, you know, dug uh, irrigation lines. And so the real estate, is expensive in that yes. high tunnel, right? So when I'm thinking about that, I'm I'm seeing dollar signs per day that that crop has to pay for. And so at that point, I'm thinking varieties that can be planted closer together so I can get more plants per square foot in there. I'm thinking about varieties that are gonna yield twice as good as the field varieties so that they can pay their rent. But, you know, the, the last thing, I, I think uh, someone would want to do with their high tunnel or should do is cram it full of stuff that's slow growing, takes up a ton of space, putting food on your own table and that high tunnel can produce everything that you need to eat. Perfect. That's great. Um, and that's a win. But if you're betting your farm and farmer's market needs to be a productive income source for you or restaurants or grocery stores or roadside stand or whatever, and you're trying to maximize how much can come out of that, we got to think about how well does this crop pay for the amount of space it takes up? How fast can I get a crop out of there? And what's the value of that? Um, and so I challenge people when they're thinking about building a high tunnel or, or trying to figure out what should I plant in there? You can plant broccoli, but if that's a 90 day crop that takes up 18 inches, you know, and at the end of the day, you can charge $3 a head for it, cram a tomato plant in there and get, you know, 30 pounds of tomatoes off it, you know? Yeah. So um, I just like to point that out. And I think that gets people thinking a little bit on, you know, how best to use their tunnel or um, how fast they might want to turn over the crops. And then when one Peter's out, let's get another one right back, right back in there. Yeah, but it's, it's very high impact, high turnover. Um, and that's how you make your money. That's why a lot of us do a lot of Salanova. We do a lot of lettuce mixes. We do mm -hmm. a lot of items like that because, you know, you're looking at a 50 day, 60 day crop turnover sure. um, and you make good money. And the way I look into it also is if I'm going to be at a farmer's market and I'm going to charge a premium price because yeah. my crop deserves a premium price, yeah. I want to give a premium product. Um, sure. You know, like you said, you can't grow a high tunnel of broccoli or cauliflower. You, you, you wouldn't make any money on it. I need that high tunnel to almost pay itself off in 12 months yep. to be profitable for me. Because I'm looking at next year of purchasing another high tunnel to, to add onto the farm. So if that high tunnel, I go into that mindset, if that high tunnel doesn't at least produce what I need to buy another high tunnel for the next year, then I'm doing something wrong. So sure. I need to find a different tomato variety, cucumber variety or lettuce varieties, whether I need to pay more or a different company, I need to look at that. Um, and what sells in your area, also dirty stuff you've got to put on pen and paper um, to, to figure out your costs and see what works for you in your area. I always tell people that everybody's area is different. Um, yep. So it, it may be potatoes in your area. It may be, you know, everything's going to be a little bit different, but you also got to look at turnover. I can turn over lettuce quicker than yep. I can tomatoes. So yes, you make a premium price on tomatoes, on heirlooms, or, or even a good determinate style slicer, but lettuce is going to outcompete that um, yeah. just because you can turn it over quicker, faster, and make more money out of it. So yeah, no, that, that's great on that. The difference between a quality insect netting might be, uh, you know, the, the size of the actual holes itself. 
right? So if that can, you know, most insect netting, yeah, it can keep a, a you know, a beetle, a cucumber beetle or potato beetle or, or, grasshopper, or, or yeah. grasshopper, right? Uh, but it might not keep a flea beetle out. It might not keep a thrip out, you know? So um, getting that really tight, fine mesh to keep some of those smaller things out of there um, is, is key because a couple things. One, to not just decimate the crop itself um, and, and have it have all that, that physical damage. But now I also want to think about, it's a little warmer in there. It's, it's, there's humidity in there. And right. a lot of these insects carry, they're a vector for plant disease. And now you, you get some insects that are chewing on those plants. They've introduced that disease to that high tunnel. And you've got pretty much a, lack of a better term, an incubation chamber for that disease, right? It's, a, it's low, it's, it's got less airflow. It's got higher humidity. It's warmer. It's got tons of food because you got all those plant, plants planted in there. Um, that's a recipe for that plant disease to then run rampant or insects to uh, nest and hatch and, and you've got all this food for them. So it's easier to keep an insect out or a disease out than it is to cure it once it's in there and running rampant. And everything here on the farm is drip irrigation. And, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons to that, you know, whether price is a, is a con or a pro, depending on you. Um, to me, it's well worth the extra money to have the convenience and the, uh, uh, the, uh, reliability of sure. watering. It's like right now, as we're talking right now, you know, it's, 3 30 in the afternoon it's almost 100 degrees here and like we, we talked about earlier i've been watering all day and i'm in the middle of watering one of my high tunnels right now as we're, as we're talking on the phone you know i can do that in 100 degree weather with drip irrigation and i'm actually um using some uh type of compost tea style jadam style fertilization right now with it injecting that into um my drip also so I find that they're, that drip is awesome. Uh, what, what are your pros or take on drip I love, irrigation? I love drip irrigation, especially when the lines are buried underneath the soil or row cover or, or mulch or, or whatever, right? So to get that water at the root zone where the plant can actually use it, where it's less likely to evaporate off, so you're getting kind of more bang for your buck. And if you can, you know, bury that drip and then when you're putting your transplants out, you're sending it on top. You're encouraging those roots to dig down to get to that water source. So it's going to promote healthy roots. Um, it's going to keep the, the soil cooler. Um, it's going to give the plant that water right where it's needed. The other thing, it, for me, it, it doesn't splash soil and dirt and debris back onto the plant. So right. any sort of soil-borne diseases are less likely to impact the plant. Blight. Um, yeah, blight, you know, is, is, is huge, right? And, and any time that you're watering from above, you're also having water droplets, you know, sit on the plant. And those things are, I don't care what it is, uh, just that droplet of water acts like a magnifying glass. And if you're watering yeah. at the heat of the day, which is when a lot of people think to, oh man, it's so hot up, my plants need it. Now you get this magnifying glass sitting on either the inside of your plastic or on the, this plant, and you can cause burn damage just with the sunlight, you know, reflecting off that that water droplet. So um, for those reasons, when there's too much humidity, it's just, you're, you're stressing the plant in, in multiple ways. So um, for all those reasons, Tracy, I like drip. And I like to bury that drip line if I can. And, and, and with me, what I found out is the cost of watering is sure. so much cheaper on drip because you're not over watering where uh, I think a lot of times where you're, you're overhead watering with your wand or however you're doing it, you know, you're dumping gallons of water on, on something when you're technically, you know, if you break it down, a lot of vegetable plants, I, I'm, I'm not a flower farmer, so I can't talk on flowers, but on vegetable wise, you know, they say that like a tomato plant or something needs like a gallon to a gallon and a half of water per plant per week. So if you're overhead watering tomatoes and you do that, let's say you do that twice a day, how many gallons of water are you dumping on that tomato plant that sure. basically that 
plant's not absorbing all that water and evaporation is caused from that. And so you're, you're spending way more money on watering overhead than you are on drip because drips, like you said, is actually putting it to the spot, to the roots where it needs to encourage those roots to go deep yeah. and which makes a stronger plant and a healthier plant. We all know that already. Um, but anyway, Randy, that's all the questions I really have for you today. Um, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot more and people will put stuff in the comments. And as uh, I encourage people to leave stuff in the comments and I read those, and then uh, the next time we do a video, I kind of take those ideas from people and look for next upcoming videos. So I may have to call on you again, buddy, to uh, <laughs> call here for topics that we could talk about throughout the year here. Um, I know that you have been uh, a, uh, a help to me over the last couple months on helping me with some of my problems um, that I've had from insects to stress and heat damage on um, certain varieties and stuff that we're working with. But guys, I think that's where I'm going to call the video this week. So once again, I want to say thank you, Randy, for being on the show this you, week. Jason. Guys, get out there and just get your hands dirty. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye.